All right, welcome to Saturday session two of AP Human Geo live on YouTube uh, through Marco Learning. Very excited to be with you again. Uh, last week, we went over the demographic transition model. Today, we'll be going over uh, cultural processes, specifically uh, origins, distribution, and uh, diffusion of culture. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. All right. Uh, next week, we'll be focusing on more uh, writing FRQs. We're going to do a practice FRQ, uh, looking at the practice one that uh, was put out by Marco Learning. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to do it yet, I know it came out later in the week, but if uh, you could please try to get that done so that we will be going it over it on Saturday next week, the weekend right before the AP exam, so that it's as fresh as possible in your mind. It's only a few days away. It's May 2nd. For us, the exam is May 12th. So we are a week and a half away from the AP exam. And uh, everything that you do now will be an opportunity for you to get that much closer to your goal of passing the AP Human Geo exam. So, all right. Uh, I want to jump right into it and be, start going over cultural processes. All right. Uh, let me just share my file with you. All right. And here we go. All right, so what we're gonna be looking at today, and this ties a lot of units together. One thing I wanna focus on here is that the main thing we're gonna be looking at today is gonna be diffusion. And diffusion overlaps a lot with migration. One of the things I really try to just hammer home all year long with my students is you know, what creates cultural similarities or things to spread you have to be able to interact with people and you can't interact with people without migration. So uh, the point is that migration is what ties all of this together. So we'll also be referring to a lot of unit two concepts, even though technically this is unit three uh, cultural processes, all right? So the specific elements we're gonna go over today uh, on the agenda, the origins and diffusion of folk and pop culture, the diffusion of language, and we're gonna be doing some uh, specific things here uh, with both the Indo-European language branch and just the use of English globally. Uh, the next is going to be distribution and diffusion of religious groups. So we also have to see where religions are concentrated. So we're going to be focusing on that and how over time they have spread. So we're going to be looking at that both from a global perspective as well as from uh, within the United States. And lastly, distribution and diffusion of U.S. ethnic groups. Where are the different ethnicities that are located within the United States? So that takes care of a lot of the unit three concepts that takes care of folk pop culture, language, religion, ethnicity. Uh, unit three is the biggest unit of uh, in terms of material. In most textbooks, it tends to be four separate chapters. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're not obviously going over four chapters worth of material in the next 45 minutes, but we are going to try to get a general idea of some of the critical concepts from that. All right. Um, just in case you haven't already, please make sure you're following at the Human Geo Guy. That's my account. Also, make it a point to follow at Marco Learning, uh, who has been great enough to put on all of this content for us uh, and uh, they're doing a really great job across the board on so many subjects uh, to get people ready for their AP exams. All right, so let's start off by talking about the origins and the fusion of folk culture. Uh, first thing we have to understand that folk culture is going to tend to be by nature smaller scale. Folk culture is going to happen in more rural areas uh, amongst populations where everybody tends to be the same, right? And, and, and that's in a nutshell folk culture. So we're going to talk about the origins of it. And this is one of those things where the reality is that there isn't a true answer for where folk culture goes, comes from it goes so far back that the origin is unknown. Like it's just kind of one of these things like this is how we do things because it's how we've always done things nature to it. The idea being that they're able to um, basically have always had this tradition. It's just something we do. The way I, I always emphasize it is Imagine like the cranky old guy in your neighborhood who yells off my lawn, it's, who yells, get off my lawn. Instead of yelling, get off my lawn, he's yelling, this is how we always do things. That's folk culture focusing on tradition. 
And also by that very fact, the idea that folk culture is something that is not happening on a broad scale, it does spread, but it spreads slowly and it happens through relocation diffusion, which if you remember from all the way in unit one, relocation diffusion is when something is able to spread based off physical movement. All right. Now, let's talk about some critical components about folk culture. First off, folk music is passed down across generations. And what it does, it either teaches a lesson or shares history. And a great example in one of the textbooks is uh, a song about Vietnamese rice farming and when the proper time to plant your seeds is. Well, you know, it's not real catchy. It's does, not the type of thing that you're gonna be hearing on the radio, but it's critical to them. Because if you plant your seeds too early, you're, you're not gonna get a good harvest. If you plant them too late, you're not gonna get a good harvest. The key is, the key is to make sure that you, are, um, that you are learning the information, that you are able to, um, that you are able to uh, share that information with, uh, with the next generations. I'm sorry, I'm can you turn on the light for me, please? Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm talking to my daughter, asking to turn on the light for me. I realize I'm sitting here in the dark. All right, there you go, a little bit better now. All right, next, uh, full clothing. Full clothing usually relates to the physical environment or religious beliefs. So in places where it's gonna be, you know, really hot, you know, they're gonna wear clothes that's a little bit more airy, lighter colors, things that don't draw in the heat. Also relating to religious beliefs. You know, some religions are very conservative and have beliefs about what women should or shouldn't wear. And basically what you're looking at there is, you know, they're gonna be very modestly dressed or covered up fully. We're gonna look at a couple of pictures to depict this in a minute, all right? Next, folk food is gonna be closely related to the physical environment. And this ties going ahead to unit five on agriculture. You know, you grow what you can grow, whatever the soil lets you, whatever the physical climate lets you, what the weather lets you, all of these things combine to what you can and can't grow. And I actually, the best way to understand this is by more so understanding what people don't eat and looking at food taboos. And a taboo is something that you just don't do. And I, it's not a coincidence that the two major religions from the Middle East, Islam and Judaism, neither of them allow for the eating of pork. You might be thinking, oh, wow, what a coincidence. And coincidences don't exist. The world makes sense. These two religions from the same part of the world don't eat pork because the reality is the physical environment limits them. If you live in the middle of the desert where it's dry and you have very limited amounts of water left, a, ter a terrible idea for the use of natural resources is going to be raising hogs. It's a colossal waste of land, water, time, and effort. You know, instead, you're much better off in the few fertile areas you have growing grains, growing wheat. All right. Lastly, folk housing is made from available materials. All right. And also design is influenced by the climate. So a couple of things that I wanted to go over here as far as folk housing. Hey, if you live in the middle of the forest, take a wild guess what your house might be made out of. Wood. All right. In contrast, you know, in terms of design, I live in Florida. One thing that's a given in Florida is that most roofs are gonna be, have a very low pitch. And the reason they have a low pitch is because here in Florida, our environmental concern in terms of weather and climate is the idea that it, it, you can get a hurricane. And literally your concern is that the roof might get ripped off your house. So by having a low pitch, it creates less force if a hurricane were to hit us, all right? So again, these are things that relate to folk housing that are gonna be very local, very specific. And here are a couple of pictures of people wearing traditional clothing. This is somebody who uh, pr uh, practiced the Jewish faith in the Orthodox fashion on the left. Uh, key features, the head covered, 
all right, wearing the hat, wearing black and white as, you know, pretty much the only colors that they wear. That is the attire of a traditional Orthodox Jewish person. In contrast, slide to the right, here you have a woman who is covering her head, most of her face except for her eyes, and that is a traditional burqa being worn by a woman in Turkey, all right? So again, this is folk clothing, traditional clothing. They wear this clothing, their children will wear, will wear this clothing, and it goes on generationally. All right, now let's shift to the origins and diffusion of pop culture, all right? Pop culture has very specific origins and typically comes from the rich world, all right? So the idea here is like, we know where these things started. We know who invented these things. And we know typically what part of the world they're coming from. It's gonna be the rich world, the developed world, uh, MDCs, all right? Now, folk culture spread slowly through relocation diffusion. In stark contrast, pop culture spreads rapidly through higher archical diffusion, all right? And higher archical diffusion, it says it there in the name, higher archical, it comes from on high. And it's gonna be coming from the centers of power. And a good way to think of this is gonna be the three cities that dominate the global economy. You're probably looking at New York, London, and Tokyo as those three cities that dominate globally, economically, as well as commercially, all right? Now, we're going to look at the same factors, but from the perspective of pop culture and how wildly different they are. First off, pop music is made for commercial purposes. Your goal, your objective is to get paid. You're here for the money, all right? And that is why, you know, a lot of these musicians, it isn't about the deep message. It isn't about, you know, trying to convey a lesson or teach history. In contrast, when it comes to pop music, it's all about the money and you're trying to get popular. A musician I, I love to use for this example is Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga is a classically trained, Juilliard trained pianist. And yet she put out like ja a jazz album and it didn't sell well. So what did she do? She went pop. She decided to be a little bit eccentric and wear the meat dress and stuff like that. And ultimately she went pop, she went global. She's one of the most you know, talented, popular artists in the world. But if you notice a lot of the stuff she's done lately, she's kind of going back to her old school roots of being a jazz singer and a jazz pianist, all right? So that is the idea of like, like for example, Lady Gaga going, she goes, she goes folk pop and has now drifted back to folk, but has made it popular as well, all right? This has exposed, pop music has exposed the world to English. These artists who are very popular in the United States, who are very popular in Europe, they will travel the world and they will tour the world. And if they sell out a stadium, you know, for, let me think, uh, you know, a popular band, you know, U2, U2, if they're playing in Tokyo, they're not learning Japanese and singing their songs in Tokyo, in Japanese, they're performing in English. And they'll have a stadium full of people, some of whom speak English, some of whom don't, all singing along with them. I've seen this in person. I uh, attended a, a rap concert with my wife's cousin who's from Colombia and doesn't speak English, only speaks Spanish, but Macklemore is performing and all of a sudden my, my wife's cousin who doesn't speak English, he's like dropping a beat and keeping up with every syllable coming out of Macklemore's mouth, all right? So the point is, it is part of what makes English global. And I'm gonna come back to that later with the diffusion of English and English as a lingua franca throughout the world, but I wanna introduce it here in the sense that it ties to specifically how English has spread throughout the world. And that's a big theme in Human Geo. That has been an FRQ question multiple times. All right, and I could see a scenario where something to that effect plays in again on the FRQs on uh, Tuesday the 12th, all right? Next up, popular clothing reflects occupation. Hey, if you have a certain job, you're expected to dress a certain way. You know, I as a teacher will wear, you know, khaki, uh, khaki pants, and a polo every day, all right? 
you know, somebody else who's like the CEO of a Fortune 500 company would, might be expected to go in, you know, uh, in a suit, whatever the case might be. Occupation ties into this. Also, the fact that popular clothing constantly changes. They have fashion shows. They're putting out new things. And the other thing it, with, with popular clothing is the idea that what's in right now might not be what's in six months from now. So you are constantly dealing with supply chains and the idea that if you have a fashion show, people have to be ready to manufacture it and ship it. And it's got to be ready to be on the shelves in as little time as possible because somebody might like, you know, a certain style of attire, you know, one day and a few weeks down the road, that's it. It's over. It's done. That moment has passed. Continuing on, popular food is about gaining access to markets and profit. Again, it's about making money. And two of the most recognized brands on earth are Coca-Cola and McDonald's, all right? These logos are known throughout the world. They appeal not just in the rich world, they even appeal in the poor world, particularly Coca-Cola. So the point here is it's not about what you can grow locally. It's about trying to find you know, a product you can sell in that part of the world. And again, tying into things that we learned previously, like with McDonald's, McDonald's in India is an example of stimulus diffusion. They brought the idea to India. They have, um, they have burgers, but they don't have beef because in India, cows are sacred. So instead they have veggie burgers. That is a theme that can connect multiple units going back to unit one stimulus diffusion coming to pop culture here. Also Coca-Cola, again, the idea that even in the poor world, you can, you know, people can aspire to get a Coca-Cola. They, they, can, they can sell it at a low enough price that people can buy it, but they're selling so much volume that it creates a profit for Coca-Cola. Lastly, popular housing creates neighborhoods with a uniform look. This contributes to another concept that, that ties into this culture unit called uniform landscapes areas where everything looks the same, all right? Every house is the same. Another term for this is cookie cutter houses. They all look similarly. You know, the big thing now, it's funny, my wife and I, we're gonna be, we're doing some work on the house. We're gonna paint the house and everybody's painting their house gray around us. And I'm kind of like resisting the idea of just doing what everybody else is doing from the standpoint of not wanting to just, you know, look like everybody else. Another example that plays this is like the idea of gated communities where all the buildings, all the structures, they not, might not be identical, but they're pretty close to it. And on this next slide, I have a picture of, uh, of that and what that looks like. Here is, you know, a, in a neighborhood where every building looks the same and it contributes to that uniform landscape. All right, um, let's continue on to preserving folk culture. All right. And preserving folk culture is going to be relating again to my immigrant to migration. I told I, I said at the beginning, this unit ties a lot into migration. All right. Migrants have to deal with adapting to new cultures. And we're looking at some critical words here, assimilation and acculturation. And assimilation is when a group or individual gives up its cultural traditions and fully adapts to the new dominant culture. Assimilation. You become part of the new culture. This was the classic American thing like 100 years ago. You had all these people coming over from Italy and they were told, don't speak Italian, lose your accent, become Americanized as quickly as possible. That is as clear definition of assimilation as possible. You know, uh, over the years, I've, I've taught hundreds of students whose backgrounds go back to Italy and only a handful of them speak Italian, all right? Now let's go to acculturation, adapting cultural features of the dominant culture while still maintaining traditional identity, still maintaining traditional identity and you begin to blend both, all right? So I always say acculturation is where you add onto the culture, all right? My family came from Cuba. My first language was Spanish. I also speak English and todavía hablo español. I still speak Spanish. So the point is I have made 
become part of the new dominant culture, but still maintain my traditional identity. And I make it a point with my own children to emphasize to them the value of being bilingual and maintaining that part of our culture, all right? Another way I could tie this would be food, you know, acculturation, adding to the culture. You know, when my family came from Cuba, they'd never heard of, of something called Thanksgiving. And yet, you know, we celebrate Thanksgiving, do so every year, ever since my parents came to this country. But here's the thing, we'll have traditional Thanksgiving dinner, turkey, mashed potatoes, yams, cranberry sauce, stuffing, all cornbread, all that good stuff. But we'll also add a little Latin flair to it. We'll have rice and beans. We might make a roasted pork dish and we'll make yucca and things that basically add our traditions to the new tradition of Thanksgiving. Lastly here, syncretism is when these two cultures come together and they basically blend so much, you can't tell where one starts and the other ends. Uh, an example of this would be you know, a place where I lived for a long time, which would be Miami, and the idea of Spanglish, the blending of English and Spanish together, you know, and, and it is that very specific Miami identity that these two things have come together. All right, now, where, we're shifting to language and the dominant language uh, family is Indo-European. Uh, it is spread from Northern India to Europe, eventually spread around the world because of European colonization and conquest. But I want you to understand where these languages originated. And again, this goes back so far that we don't know the answer. There are two theories here. First is the Kurgan her theory also is the Anatolian hearth theory, right? And I will talk you through them and then I'll draw them on the next slide. The Kurgan hearth theory is that thousands of years ago, nomadic warriors that originated in modern day Russia traveled, conquered and spread their language. So you have the Kurgan warriors from Russia conquering people and teaching people how to speak languages that are the source of what would become the Indo-European language family, including what I'm speaking right now, all right? The Anatolian hearth theory is not conquest, it's farmers. And as they shared their techniques from modern day Turkey, they spread their languages around them. So there are two main theories, the Kurgan hearth theory and the Anatolian hearth theory. And I wanna show you on this map here, what they basically look like, all right? So I'm gonna change my color to something a little stronger here, all right? So these are the Kurgans, all right? And the thought process is they conquered in every direction around them. And that's how these languages ended up being similar to one another, all right? That's the Kurgan her theory, warriors traveling, all right? Next, all right, I'm gonna to shift to another color. Here's the other theory. The Anatolian theory is that from modern day Turkey, these farmers spread towards Europe, towards Northern India, and that their languages spread in that way, all right? The little brain trick I have taught myself, and I'm gonna jump back to the previous slide, the Kurgan theory and the Anatolian theory. For me, the way I remember them, because both, you know, the idea of how language is spread and all that sounds generally similar. All right, the Kurgans, all right, I focus on the R in the middle of Kurgan, R for Russian. Over here, Anatolian has a T right smack in the middle, T for Turkey. So the way I remember the difference between the two, Kurgan Russian warriors, Anatolian Turkey farmers. That's it make it as simple as possible to show where these languages came from and how they spread over time. All right, continuing on, now we're gonna be looking at how English diffused around the world as the, you know, and has basically become the world's unofficial language, all right? I'm gonna write here, English become the world's unofficial language, a huge theme in Human Geo, multiple times in FRQ, I could see a situation where I don't think it would be the full FRQ on the 12, 
but I could see how you could tie this into a, as a portion of an FRQ, all right? Now, the initial global presence of English is pretty simple, the British Empire. The British went around the world and established the biggest colonial empire that anybody's ever seen. The famous phrase is the sun never set on the British Empire. And the idea that it was so far flung that if it was nighttime in one part of the world, it was daytime in the other part of the world, and yet the British had a presence in all of these places, all right? Over time, English has morphed into a lingua franca, a language of international communication. And what are the things that have made it the language of international communication? First off, it's the language of entertainment. I already emphasized the music aspect of it, English music being played all over the world. But also think about television. I have visited other parts of the world and I'm watching a, you know, in my, my hotel at night, I'm watching a rerun of Friends and it's in English with the local subtitles. That is exposure. Think about these movies that are popular all over the world. Think of a movie like Avengers Endgame, where literally, you know, that's, it makes, you know, over a billion dollars, I think even way more than that, multiple billions of dollars. People have seen it all over the world multiple times, and the movie is playing in these theaters around the world in English, right? It's also the language of international trade. The example I always give here, if a, if a company in Japan and a company in Peru want to do business with each other, all right, the Peruvian business leaders are not going to learn Japanese. The Japanese business leaders are not going to learn Spanish. What they'll probably do is conduct all their meetings in English because it's more likely than not that they all speak English. Also, it's the language of travel. If you have gone on an international flight, they typically will say the announcement in the language of that airline and then repeat it again in English, all right? Also, if you're going through customs, they all speak English. Aviation happens in all English, all right? Around the world, the, the, uh, pilots are communicating with air traffic control in English. It is also the language of the internet. An overwhelming amount of internet content is produced in English. English, all right? Lastly, it's the language of the UN and diplomacy. When countries want to speak to one another, they are talking to each other in English. Good example of this, in, uh, in 2018, they were celebrating the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, and um, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, and the German leader, Angela Merkel, were talking to each other. Well, Emmanuel Macron, his main language is French, Angela Merkel, her main language is German. But when they speak to each other, they speak to each other in fluent English. They both know English is the point here. So it's the language of diplomacy as well. All right, next, a pidgin language is the simplified form of a language. This is when speakers of different languages learn a basic version of English that might also you know, intertwine some elements of their own. Uh, I, I like to reference, it becomes very basic language. And uh, what you end up with there is a situation where, you know, it's very noun heavy, very verb heavy. You know, it's not necessarily an academic language, but you use it for basic communication. And that would be a pidgin language. All right. The growth of English, I referenced Spanglish earlier, the blending of Spanish and English. Where you see this a lot is in the US with having such a large Hispanic population, all right? Also, um, you know, areas where you'll see this in Southern California with so many, you know, Hispanic people, people speaking Spanglish. In Miami, so many Cubans, people speaking Spanglish. You know, in, growing up in North Jersey, there's a big Hispanic population. I heard Spanglish a lot. The idea that you would tie the two uh, languages together. Franglais, you get a lot, of, that is the blending of French and English, and that's common in Quebec and in France. And that's a big theme, particularly in Quebec, where language has been such a divisive issue historically to the point where twice Quebec voted on whether or not to remain part of Canada and the fact that they have to have signage in English and in French, and the idea that Franglais is kind of a bridge between the two. Side note, and this isn't about English so much, but 
the global role of English, Mandarin, may grow as China's role in the global economy grows. You know, I have a family member who majored in international business. You know, he already spoke Spanish, he already spoke English. He made it a point to learn Mandarin so that he can, could conduct business in China. And he ended up living there for a year working, all right, while, you know, because he was able to speak Mandarin, his company placed him in China for a year. And it, was, it created a professional opportunity for him. So Mandarin might grow in that aspect down the road. All right, now we're going to shift from language to religion. And I'm going to go over quickly what a universalizing religion, what an ethnic religion is, because the, the definition of these also imply the idea of how these religions were able to diffuse or didn't diffuse, you know, more specifically. All right, so universalizing religions, religion that tries to appeal to all people regardless of location. And this point here, key party space is trying to convert people. You are actively trying to recruit people to convert to your religious ideals. The big three for universalizing religions are going to be Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism. All right, so these three religions have diffused primarily because that is part of their belief system. You need to go out and convert people. And as you travel, you're going to try to convert these people to your faith. Now let's look at ethnic religions, all right? These are religions that people are born into. So people are born into these. They're usually concentrated in one part of the world. Sometimes they're even referenced as folk religions. So if we're looking at it from the folk culture, pop culture lens, ethnic religions are the folk religions. Universalizing religions are the pop religions, the popular religions, all right? So ethnic religions they don't seek out new followers. They're often tied to the physical environment. So they are relating to people specifically in one part of the world. And the biggest example of this is Hinduism. You know, for Hinduism, there isn't a talk about diffusion of Hinduism because there isn't a diffusion of Hinduism for the most part. The overwhelming majority of Hindus live in India. And the only exception to that pretty much, you know, is people that are from India and have moved to other parts of the world. So we're not going to spend much time on the fusion of ethnic religions because there really isn't the need to reference that because there isn't much diffusion for the ethnic religions. The one exception is the Jewish faith. I want to put this out there now because I don't think I have it in a later slide. Uh, because of their history, the fact that they were kicked out of Jerusalem uh, for, by the Roman Empire, they did have the diaspora, the idea that they ended up in all parts of the world, North America, Europe, Latin America. And, uh, and they did have a broad disper uh, dispersal because of their history having been taken from what you know, they saw as their homeland uh, around Jerusalem. All right, continuing. The distribution of Christians, all right? A bunch going on, a lot of information here. It'll make more sense in a minute because on the next slide I have a map, all right? In the Western Hemisphere, Europe, uh, Western Hemisphere, so basically the Americas, Europe, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. When you're in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's, there's, there's a mixed bag. You have areas that are Christian, areas that are Muslim, uh, minorities of people that still practice animism. So like, there's a lot going on there, all right? Oceania, Australia, New Zealand, these areas will be predominantly Christian. There are three main branches of Christianity. Roman Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox. One thing you need to know is that all three of these are Christian groups, but they have large divisions amongst them. I'm not going to get into what they are here because that would be a much longer conversation, but what you need to understand is that each has its own way of, of practicing their faith and also the idea that they all tend to be distributed in particular areas. North America, so the United States and Canada, is predominantly Protestant, but there are a significant number of Catholics. One thing to keep in mind when it comes to Protestants, Protestants have multiple denominations. So you have subgroups of people who are Protestant. All right, so it's a little bit tricky because there are more Catholics than there are Baptists. 
but Baptists are a type of Protestant and all the Protestants added up together are more than the Catholic population. Latin America is overwhelmingly Catholic. It's about 90-ish percent. Uh, the joke I like to make is, uh, you, know, ev you know, in Latin America, everybody's Catholic and my mama. The idea that, you know, that is how she was raised in her Christian faith to be Catholic, all right? Next, Western Europe is primarily Roman Catholic. So you're looking at like Spain, Portugal, France, Italy. Those are primarily Catholic. But you have large concentrations in Northern Europe. So Northern Germany, Scandinavia, the UK, they are predominantly Protestant. And when you go further east, Eastern Europe is predominantly Orthodox. So you should know, have a general idea of that. And the most general way of saying it, Western Europe, Catholic, Northern Europe, Protestant, Eastern Europe, Orthodox. It's not perfect, but it gives you the general idea of the religious breakdown. All right, looking at it on this slide, again, North America, predominantly Protestant. There are uh, there's a mixed bag of Protestants and Catholics in Canada because of Quebec, which is predominantly Catholic. Latin America, overwhelmingly Catholic. And like I said here, Western Europe, primarily Catholic. All right. And now shifting to Northern Europe, you know, Scandinavia, Northern Germany, the UK, they're mainly Protestant. And you have Eastern Europe, including Russia primarily Orthodox. So that's the Christian breakdown, all right? Let's go to now, for, for the, that's a Christian breakdown for the world. Let's focus on the United States for a minute. The U.S. has broad religious patterns, all right? It, the Northeast, the Southwest, South Florida, Southern Louisiana, and parts of the Midwest are most, mostly Catholic. This is all about migration. Where are these people coming from in the Northeast? a lot of Irish and Italian Catholics. In the Southwest, a lot of people from Latin America, specifically Mexico, Catholic. South Florida, lots of Hispanics, specifically Cuban, Catholic. Southern Louisiana, you have that strong French influence, right? So they bring their Catholicism with them there. And lastly, the Midwest, a lot of Polish people, a lot of German background, again, Catholic. So this all ties back to migration and the idea that when people travel, they bring their culture, they bring their identity with them, right? For the South, it is overwhelmingly Baptist to the point that it's one of the identifying features of the South that they're overwhelmingly Baptist and even go by the term of the Bible Belt. Next, the Mormon population. They are predominant in Utah and parts of the surrounding states. They're going to be primarily Mormon. Well, why did the Mormons settle, settle out in Utah? They were heavily discriminated against in the different places where they lived. First upstate New York, then Pennsylvania, then Ohio, then Illinois, then Missouri. I think I have that progression right. I might be skipping a step. The point is they kept moving in, in, in intervals further west. It's actually an example of that. That's an example of step migration. Small move, small move, small move, small move, eventually moving further west. And eventually they got so tired of being persecuted, they moved all the way out west to Utah and basically settled there because it was isolated, it was dry, it was not the best farmland, and they figured nobody's going to mess with us out here. The popular, there, there's little to no population here. They weren't even competing with the native population. There wasn't many, much of a native population in Utah. They settled there and built up their utopian, specific to their religion, uh, uh, home for them, right? Lastly, the upper Midwest has a large number of Lutherans, all right? And this comes back to the fact that they have a lot of people settled there from Northern Germany, from Sweden, from Norway. That also impacts their speech patterns, even the name of the football team. It's not a coincidence that people from Norway 
are were one of the dominant ethnic groups in a place that is where the football team is called the Minnesota Vikings. All right. So again, all of these things tying together in terms of where they are settled here. And you can see it on this map here. The Northeast, you're going to have predominantly Catholic, Florida Catholic, the entire Southwest Catholic, and big areas of the Midwest Catholic. Let me switch to another color. Here in the South, you have the Baptist faith, which is predominant through there. The other exceptions I want to show you, let me go with a lighter color, orange here. All right, you have Utah, predominantly Mormon, and I'll just use the same color here. You have North Dakota, South Dakota, primarily Lutheran. If you could see it by a county breakdown, you would be able to see Minnesota and Iowa. By the way, I want to make a quick reference on scale, because that's the type of thing that you might see. That's something the College Board heavily emphasize, emphasizes for Human Geo. This is a national map, but what you have to understand is that the scale on this map is state. The data is state. When you're trying to break down what information they want, you're breaking it down based off of the data you have. So you might see a national map, but the data is state map. And if it was broken down even further, the data would be county. All right, let's continue on. Distribution of Muslims. Islam is dominant in the Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia also dominant in Indonesia and parts of East Africa. And there's also a large minority of, uh, of Muslims in India, all right? They're, the, they're a huge minority. I know that's a weird way of saying that. Dominant there, of course, is Hinduism, but there are huge numbers of Muslims there. Also, Pakistan and Bangladesh and South Asia, huge uh, Muslim populations. And both are top 10 populations and the vast majority of people are uh, Muslim there. The two major branches of Islam are Sunni and Shiite. Sunnis are about 90% of all Muslims, but Shiites tend to cluster together. They are the majority in Iran, Eastern Iraq, Bahrain, Azerbaijan, and in Lebanon. So the way I always emphasize this, most Muslims are Sunni, but where you find one Shiite, you will likely find many Shiites, all right? Also know, and again, diffusion of the religion, Islam is growing in Europe and North America due to migration. When people travel, they bring their cultural identity with them, their faith with them, and it's a common sight, in, in, particularly in Europe, because they're closer the idea that they are, have an increased number of Muslims and mosques. All right, Buddhists. Buddhists are the predominant religious group in East Asia. But one thing to keep in mind with Buddhism is that the majority of people in East Asia don't practice any religion. And that goes back to the fact that it was discouraged by the communist Chinese governments. This is a constant theme. This is also something that could come up as part of an FRQ, religious conflict, a relationship, between communist governments. In Russia, this was a major issue. They tore down Orthodox churches. In Cuba, they shut down Catholic churches. In China, they have persecuted uh, different religious groups, including like even right now, like they, they are persecuting Muslims in real time right now there, all right? But the other thing I wanna add is the idea that they do not want the Buddhist faith, the people that practice the Buddhist faith to practice Buddhism not so much because they have anything specifically against Buddhism, they just have something against religion in general. You know, don't forget, religion is also a means by which you can, you know, control the population. And these communist governments do not want to compete for control of the hearts and minds of the people. They don't want you loyal to your faith and the state. They want you loyal only to the state. Actually, the country where this has played out the most is North Korea, where literally the relationship between the population and the government has, has evolved to the point where it's basically a religion called Juke, spelled J-U-C-H-E, and it's basic, might as well be called Kimism, as they worship the different Kim uh, leaders generationally, going back to Kim Il-sung, to Kim Jong-il, to currently Kim Jong-un. And I don't know much, but I know this, the next leader of North Korea 
is going to be a member of the Kim family, right? I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong. All right, continuing. Difficult to count because many Buddhists also consider themselves to be one of the traditional uh, Eastern ethnic religions. Many also consider themselves to be Confucianist or Taoist, traditional ethnic religions, folk religions in China, or Shintoism, which is the ethnic religion of Japan. So you can be Buddhist and one of these three. So getting a feel for counting them is tricky. Like in Japan, for example, depending on how you define it, you either have a very small number of Buddhists or almost everybody's a Buddhist, depending on how tight you make that definition. And this, again, that term syncretism, things coming together, syncretic religions is the combining of multiple traditions. All right, the diffusion of religions and how these religions spread. Now the physical act of how they became broad and global. Christianity spread throughout the world because of European conquest and colonialism. Tying this to unit four, colonialism and imperialism, remember the three Gs, God, gold, and glory. Yes, they focused more on gold and plundering resources. Yes, they cared more about glory in terms of you know, competing with one another for power, but they really did want to go out and convert people towards Christianity and also not just towards Christianity, but to their type of Christianity. So for example, the British were spreading Protestant ideals. The Portuguese, Spanish, and French were spreading Catholic ideals. And you need to remember that. What branch of Christianity were they pushing forward as well? Islam. Islam initially diffused through military conquest throughout the rest of the Middle East, eventually pushing into North Africa, Central Asia, into the region always called the Stands, India, South Asia, and parts of Europe. People forget that the, Mus the, 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 the Muslims were able to spread all the way into the Iberian Peninsula, into Spain, into Portugal, and that's why there's a lot of overlap between North African culture and uh, Iberian culture, Spain and Portugal. And where you see this the most is the impact of architecture. When you're in Spain, when you're in Portugal, you see a lot of domes. Why? That was the influence of the Moors, of the Muslim invaders that came across from North Africa. All right. Later, they shifted away from military conquest and pushed more through trade routes. And eventually their trade routes pushed them across the Saharan desert into sub-Saharan Africa into the east coast of Africa and all the way across the Indian Ocean into Indonesia. Most people assume Indonesia, it's Asia, those people must be Buddhist. No, the overwhelming majority religion in Indonesia is Islam. Lastly, Buddhism. Buddhism diffused slowly from northern India and Nepal through trade routes, specifically the Silk Road is how Buddhism spread. But there's a unique thing that happened with Buddhism. It starts in Northern Indian Nepal, shifts east towards China, and eventually fades out in its hearth, in its origin. So basically, Northern India, there are almost no Buddhists, all right, so it phases out. There are almost no Buddhists in Northern India. And in Nepal, there are only about 10% of the population. All right, let's continue on. I'm going to try to go quickly through this U.S. ethnic distribution. So we're focusing on ethnicity for the next few minutes. Hispanics are the biggest ethnic group, 17% of the U.S. population. Growing rapidly because of immigration, people still coming from Latin America and higher birth rates amongst the Hispanic population. The origin points for these people, primarily Mexico. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is tricky because they're legally American citizens, but they are also still culturally very much going through the immigrant experience. El Salvador, my people, Cubans, Dominican Republic, Guatemala, Colombian, uh, my wife's people. So these people come in large numbers, but they even have their own patterns. Mexicans tend to settle along the Southwest. Why? It's distance decay. It's literally right there on the border. In Puerto Rico, you get a lot of um, Sorry, you get a lot of Puerto Ricans and Dominicans in New York. Why? It's chain migration. 
Early communities were established there and others have followed since then. Cuba, my people, South Florida, Miami, that's not a coincidence. It's the biggest city that's close to there. It's, it, again, it's distance decay. For Hispanics, you will have urban populations as well as rural populations. And you have rural populations specifically because of the connection to, uh, to th their role in farm work. African-Americans, the black population, approximately 12% of the US population concentrated in the Southeast. And that goes back to the origins of them being forced over here as a slave population. They also over time have developed a large concentration in urban areas. I'm gonna to get to that on the last slide. All right, this is, I didn't label it, but this is the Hispanic population. Hey, not surprisingly, look where you find them in the Southwest, in Florida, all right? Up in the Northeast, because again, big urban centers tend to draw people in. But notice something also, while it's not as dark, there are still Hispanic populations in these like in places like Nebraska and Wyoming, places we don't associate with being major, you know, magnets for Hispanic people, that's going to be the role in agricultural work. All right. Asian Americans, approximately 5% of the U.S. population. All right. You're getting people from China, the Philippines, India, Vietnam, Korea, and Japan. The biggest concentration are going to be California, Hawaii, the West Coast. And again, another example of distance decay. If you travel across the Pacific Ocean, the West Coast is what is closest to them. Also, they are clustered in urban areas. The Asian population tends to be an urban population. Lastly, Native Americans are less than 2% of the U.S. population. They're concentrated in isolated areas in the western half of the US, and they live in the land set aside for them as reservations. All right. And again, these are the lands that basically, you know, the American government managed to not steal from them over the last couple of centuries. All right. Here is a map. And if you go back and look at the video, uh, I don't have time to go through each different group here, but I just really want to emphasize for you. If you pause it and look at the breakdown of the different, um, the different areas where these people are populated, you are, are concentrated, you will see the broad patterns. I have indicated Hispanics in the Southwest, the Black population in the South, you know, a mixed bag in the Northeast because it's such a major draw for so many immigrant groups. And, and you can really make out the patterns and also the native population. Let me change the color on my marker to green. Native populations, where in areas out west where the population numbers tend to be generally small. All right, let's continue on from there. And I should be wrapping up in the next like two to three minutes. International migration of ethnicities. Most African Americans are descendants of West Africans brought over as slave groups. Let me change the color on my highlighter. It's obviously the biggest example, the largest forced migration in history. So that can be a tie again to the migration unit. It's a forced migration of an entire race of people over. In the US, heavily concentrated in the Southeast because of their work on cotton and tobacco plantations. So that is the, the, the experience for the African-American population, all right? I'm gonna jump ahead. And again, this is how they were brought over, packed, like like sardines into conditions that are unimaginable, tied down, no access to bathrooms, like a third of them died making this journey, like absolutely horrific conditions that these people were brought over. And that is the origin of having an African population in this part of the world. I'm gonna shift over to now the Hispanic and Asian population. Their migration has been recent started in the 60s when immigration laws were relaxed. And most of these people coming were economic immigrants. They came in search of jobs. All right, last one, the internal migration. I just realized I had a duplicate slide there. The internal migration of African-Americans. After the Civil War, most freed slaves became sharecroppers in the rural South. And this trapped them in a cycle of debt. And I don't have enough time to just get really deep into what sharecropping was. But basically, life before the Civil War and life after the Civil War for the Black population in the South really didn't change much. They were, you know, laborers working on 
you know, on cotton plantations or tobacco plantations, and their options were very limited. Millions of African Americans migrated away from the South to large cities between 1960 and 1970. This is known as the Great Migration, and their influence was that they were seeking factory jobs and to avoid discrimination. So the push factors out of the South were discrimination and poverty. The pull factors to the North were factory jobs and less discrimination. I'm not saying there was discrimination in the South, but there was much less, all right? And here's a famous art picture here. And what it shows you, uh, the artist is Jacob Lawrence, the depiction of, the, um, depiction of what it looked like for these people. You see them loading up to get to Chicago, to New York, to St. Louis, to go to these urban centers. All right, that is it for me. Let me just stop my share for a moment. I did want to tell you next week, I'm gonna be doing a full on FRQ. Uh, please go on Marco Learning, get that free resource and we will go over it together and we'll look at what it takes to put together a top notch FRQ. Follow at the Human Geo Guy, follow at Marco Learning. Thank you for joining me today and can't wait to see you again next week. Happy studying. Good luck. You're going to do great on the test. All right, everybody. Take care. Bye.